Now I'd like to welcome Dr. Shannon Chang up for her presentation. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday. And I have to say, this is my first um, non-Zoom lecture. Um, so I'm really excited to not be talking to a computer screen right now. Um, you guys are much more attractive than my computer screen. So um, Today, my lecture is going to be about fertility and IBD. Um, I hope that it can be informative and just feel free to write on those pieces of paper any questions you have as they're coming out, okay? All right, so these are my disclosures. Okay, so let's start off with just some definitions. So fertility is defined as the ability to produce offspring or children, and infertility is the ability to achieve a pregnancy after one year of unprotected regular sex. Um, so this schematic you can see at the bottom, let's see, does this work? Yeah, you guys can see this. So in terms of the mechanics of it, let's look at the picture here. This is your uterus. Uh, not everyone in this room has a uterus, but this is the fallopian tube, and here is the ovary where all your eggs are stored. So when a woman is during having her fertile period, um, an egg, just one or two eggs, is released into the fallopian tube, and it travels down, and hopefully it will meet a sperm, it will get fertilized, and then it will continue to travel down the fallopian tube into the uterus and implant in the uterine wall, and that is the beginning of a pregnancy. So this has implications for what we're going to talk about later. So why are we here talking about fertility? Well, it has uh, a lot to do with IBD and, and all of our patients that we take care of. So the typical age of diagnosis for Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, as you know, is typically between the ages of 15 and 35. In these two decades, that coincides with a lot of major life events, including uh, your most fertile period and your sexual maturation. So one thing that's really nice for all the doctors and healthcare practitioners that are here today is being able to be part of this experience and planning uh, for these major life changes with our patients. So I see a lot of our patients go through dating, you know, getting engaged, planning the wedding, finally getting married in the case of COVID, um, and then g going on to their family planning to have children. So it's a big issue, and uh, we like to talk about it early and often. So I'm going to time out here. I've created a list. I surveyed some of my patients, some of the other practitioners, about concerns and misconceptions surrounding fertility and pregnancy. So I want to see everyone raise their hands if they've heard any of these things or been told it or thought it or Googled it and read it. Uh, number one, I have UC or Crohn's and I'm not able to have children. Okay. Number two, I don't want to pass on IBD to my children. That's a big one, right? Okay. Number three, it's harder to get pregnant after having surgery. Yes. My medications will harm the fetus. And five, my IBD will harm the fetus. Okay. All right. So some of these are true, some of these are partially true, and some of these are completely false. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about each one of these and um, can answer questions as we proceed. So IBD and fertility. It is possible to get pregnant and have healthy children with IBD, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's, and after surgery. Um, the thing that we focus on most as physicians is that a healthy mom leads to a healthy baby, okay? So women in remission, and that's inflammation being controlled. That's not, I feel fine, okay? That's that your doctor has evaluated and looked for evidence of active inflammation. Uh, women in remission have fertility rates that are similar as what we call the general population. That means everyone else without IBD, okay? And factors affecting fertility are going to be active disease, and then we'll talk about pelvic surgery. The IPAA, or the ileal pouch anal anastomosis, also known as the J pouch, and a proctectomy, which is removal of the rectum. Those are two common pelvic surgeries that patients with IBD have. 
So we talked a little bit about active disease, and especially in Crohn's disease, this tends to be an issue with fertility. So multiple studies have shown that there's higher infertility rates with active, uncontrolled Crohn's disease. Uh, infertility rates, depending on the study you read, have been uh, quoted to be between 5 and 14 percent. And this may be uh, exemplified by something like a decreased AMH. AMH stands for anti-malarian hormone. It's one of the first uh, blood tests that your doctor is going to check if you're looking um, for uh, workup for infertility. Anti-malarian hormone is a good um, estimate of how many eggs that you have left, okay? So we know that in that ovary that I showed you a picture of, a girl is born with all the, ov all the um, eggs that she's going to have when she's born, and over time they go down. Um, and so the AMH is just an estimate of the storage. But it does not speak to the qual quality of the eggs, okay? So even if your AMH is low, it can mean um, it means that you maybe have fewer eggs left, but not that the eggs are bad or anything like that. So other studies have shown in Crohn's disease, an age greater than 25, um, and active disease increased the risk of infertility. So clearly, the older that you are after the age of 25, that should not be surprising, right? The risk of infertility increases with age. And I want to just drive home this point. Better disease control means better outcomes. So I'm going to show you the color coding here. There's lots of bars here. But this dark blue is going to be everyone else without IBD. This light blue is going to be Crohn's disease in remission. Orange is going to be Crohn's disease that's active. Dark orange is going to be ulcerative colitis in remission. And purple is ulcerative colitis that's active. So what I can first draw your attention to is this group here of congenital abnormalities. You can see that it, the good news is it doesn't matter if your colitis or your Crohn's is active or inactive, the risk of congenital abnormalities, aka birth defects, is the same as the general population, okay? So your IBD or the physical um, having of a diagnosis of IBD does not affect your baby's um, risk of getting birth defects, okay? In the general population, all in, it can be somewhere between two, 2 to 3% of children that are born, okay? So it can still happen, um, but it's not going to be because of the IBD, per se, okay? So then, I turn your attention to these columns over here, preterm birth and spontaneous abortion. You can see with active Crohn's, the rates of this is higher, as well as with active ulcerative colitis. So this drives home the point when we talk to our patients, we say healthy mom, healthy baby, okay? So um, preterm birth is a problem because you're born early, right? You're, you're cooked for less time, you have less time to grow and mature, and that increases your risk of complications um, in the early period, but also um, in the childhood years and then an increased risk of pregnancy loss if the mom is not, uh, is not feeling well, does not have um, control of the inflammation, which I think would make sense, right? You want the body to be um, a happy place to incubate a baby, and if there's a lot of inflammation, if you're not able to eat, if you're having a lot of diarrhea, you're not absorbing your nutrients, it makes sense that the pregnancy could be at risk. So the, the sum total here is talk to your doctor often about your, your family planning. If, uh, if it's not you, if it's your son or daughter, um, and, you, and they're thinking about having kids, they want to talk to their uh, doctor about, you know, what are the medicines I'm on, um, what should I be doing um, to, to move towards this plan I have in, you know, X number of months. So talking about surgery and fertility, most of the studies that look at surgery uh, and fertility in IBD are going to be focused on pelvic surgeries, namely the ileal pouch anal anastomosis, because it is one of the most common in terms of surgeries in uh, ulcerative colitis. And what we have found study after study is that there is an increased risk of infertility after J pouch surgery on the order of three to four fold uh, over a, an average person. Um, but the type of surgery may matter. So la this study shows that laparoscopic um, J-pouch surgery may 
lead to more live births or less infertility as compared to open surgery. So it's important to talk to your doctor and your surgeon about the type of techniques that are available um, and how they feel about um, their, their fertility rates afterward. Um, so the good news is, if even if you have um, problems conceiving after a, a pelvic surgery, uh, there is assisted reproductive technology available for IBD, and it does work. So what is assisted reproductive technology? The most common things you're going to hear are IUI, or intrauterine insemination, and then IVF, or in vitro fertilization. Uh, then what we have seen in the literature is that the rates of live births after in vitro fertilization are, very, are, are indistinguishable from patients with ulcerative colitis without surgery, and then also to the general population. So, you know, if, if it goes to that, which, you know, some people need to have that assistance anyways without IBD, then you can be assured that the results are, are good, okay? Um, so in my practice, and I think most of us here, we do refer to reproductive endocrinology, which is aka the IVF doctors, after about six months of inability to conceive, particularly if a patient has uh, had pelvic surgery. I do talk to my patients a lot about this, um, you know, not necessarily delaying um, surgery if it's necessary, but if it's an elective, like a J pouch after a colectomy, uh, for my young females, I do give them the option and talk to them about considering maybe having their children while they still have the ostomy and then reversing and doing the J pouch um, after they're done with their family planning. Um, IBD medications, thankfully, have no effect on egg freezing or the effectiveness of uh, um, IVF. And uh, there's been no association between the hormones associated that you have to use and inject yourself with during egg storage or, or the IVF process and IBD activity. So that's really a positive. So will I give, uh, will my child be born with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis if I have Crohn's or ulcerative colitis? So it's a complicated question. Um, there, and it's not very straightforward because it's not like certain other diseases where there's one gene that you can test for and, and you can test for that in the baby or in the, in the feed, in the embryo, right? Or I think it's called a blastocyst technically. Um, so there are, as you can see, uh, a lot of genes that are common uh, between Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, and then some that are just associated more with Crohn's and some more associated with ulcerative colitis. Um, the main risk factor for developing IBD is having a first degree relative, so mother, father, sister, brother uh, with IBD, okay? Um, and if uh, only one parent has ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, the risk is less than 10% that the child is going to develop it, and that risk is higher with Crohn's disease than ulcerative colitis. However, if both parents have IBD, there's about a 30% lifetime risk for children developing IBD. So it's still the minority, okay, but there is a, a increased risk over the average person. But it's not all genetics. So I find this fascinating, and I, I think there are studies ongoing about understanding risk factors. Monozygotic twins, so identical twins, twins that are born from one egg, they have all the same genes. You can see that the risk of uh, both of those twins developing Crohn's disease is 40 to 50 percent, whereas with ulcerative colitis, it's only 10 to 15 percent. So there's something else you know, going on that also plays into this, be it the environment or other things that we're not clear about. Um, that, so, so I hope that the one take home from this slide can be that it's not a guarantee, okay? Uh, and to finish up here, so there's, uh, the vast majority of the drugs we use are safe um, in pregnancy and conception and breastfeeding, but I just highlighted a few in red. Red means stop. I do this with my children a lot now, so red means stop. So we want to make sure that none of these medications are used um, in, uh, in the first trimester for sure, but for the case of methotrexate for the three to six months before. So methotrexate in pill or injectable form is very high risk for, um, for birth defects. 
and it can also and is used for um, termination of pregnancy. So methotrexate in our young females uh, is a no-no if they're trying to conceive, and then any of our patients on methotrexate, I do advise to be on birth control if there is no plan to have children imminently. Um, so we do try to stop at three to six months prior to conception. In men, there has been some talk as to whether or not it decreases the sperm quantity, um, but a more recent study uh, published this year suggests that low-dose methotrexate um, does not, has not been shown to affect the sperm. So I think it's a, a decision that, you guys ha that you'd have to make with your doctor if you're on methotrexate and you're the man trying to conceive. Uh, steroids in the first trimester have a small, small risk of cleft palate and cleft lip, so we do use ca advise caution in the first trimester. And then, of course, throughout pregnancy in general, we're not big fans of steroids, you know, because it increases your risk of diabetes, gestational diabetes, potential adrenal insufficiency. The baby can be really large if, uh, if you're on steroids as well. Um, and then the two antibiotics, Cipro and Flagyl, potential birth defects associated um, during the first trimester. Although I do think that obstetricians are um, a little bit more lenient on metronidazole and that that risk is, is quite low. Uh, green means go or good for all of these. So these are pretty much the most common medications that everyone's on. I'll draw your attention to the mesalamines. Acicol HD used to have something called a diabutyl phthalate coating that uh, potentially was of concern. So we used to stop our moms from taking that and switch to another mesalamine. But the manufacturers have taken that ingredient out of the coating. So now all mesalamines are safe during pregnancy. Sulfasalazine may uh, decrease uh, the, the sperm motility, so we do uh, discuss that with patients, um, with the men beforehand, um, but it can be continued during pregnancy. Um, and then the biologics, azathioprine, 6-MP, and very few of us are on cyclosporin, but those are considered low risk in pregnancy. And caution is advised with these just simply because they are newer, and there's just not a lot of pregnancy data out there. So the small molecules that have come out, ozanamide, tofacitinib, upatacitinib, um, these, as you can see, are, have been approved relatively recently. Uh, tofacitinib probably came out around 2018, I want to say. Um, and then risenkizumab is the new kid on the block for Crohn's disease, just approved in June. Um, I do believe that this one will be safe. Um, it's just we don't have enough pregnancy information on it yet. So. Uh, it wouldn't be my first choice. Um, I don't like my patients to be the first cases, so <laughs> it's my preference. Um, okay, so recommendations. Uh, you've heard a lot today about advocating uh, for yourself, your loved ones with IBD. You want to um, talk to your doctor frequently about, you know, is this, you know, the right choice for me because I may want to start a family soon. You want to really optimize that disease control. The best thing is when, uh, when my patient will say, you know, I want to have kids in maybe a year or two. That really puts me on high alert. It gives me um, an idea of how to choose medications, about how to think about follow-up exams, like their imaging, their colonoscopies, you know, so that we can plan together. Um, let your doctor know about your goals, and, uh, you know, this pertains to medication, surgery, and also the workup. And, um, if you're trying for more than six months and you haven't been able to get pregnant, uh, please ask your doctor to be referred to a reproductive endocrinologist for evaluation. So thank you everyone. It was really nice to be here today and it wouldn't be a fertility lecture without me uh, showing you all a video of a photo of uh, my latest embryo. So <laughs> thanks you guys.